Hey, good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing here? Everyone's on the sides. This is come in, right? It's got some empty spaces. Hey, welcome to our online campus, and let's welcome our PAL campus right now. Yeah, PAL, glad to have you. Everyone on board today. It's going to be a great day. It is a great day. We're going to enjoy this time together. Hey, we had all of our first responders out Friday night. I got a chance to meet all some police officers, fire department, people. And uh, it was awesome. I want to thank them again and you if you helped in that uh, event. That was great. And got to meet people that actually work right around our area for the first time, some of them. And so that was a wonderful time. And if you're watching or you're here and you are a first responder, you didn't make it out, let's just say thank you. We certainly appreciate all of your hard work to help people. Amen. And so that's a good thing to do. Well, today we're going to jump into a topic. As I was praying this week, I really felt the Holy Spirit kind of dealing with me about this. And so I want to get into that. And simple title, one word, just consider. All right? So just consider. All right. So over the last few months, as you know, Dren and I travel quite a bit. We have the opportunity to teach and preach uh, conferences and other churches And over the last few months, we have seen a great increase in demonic activity. Uh, Demons manifest in the service, coming out with shrieks and screams or manifestations, people needing deliverance, asking for prayer. And so I began to ask the Lord, you know, what what is going on? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, as our country keeps legalizing perverse things, then demons have a legal free will to have more influence in our society. Number two, our culture is feeding on perverse stuff, uh, demonically inspired things that uh, people are feeding on as a means of entertainment or just being in the culture, social media and various things. And so as people feed on those things, they don't even realize that they're opening themselves up to a demonic activity and bondage in their lives. And so I really felt impressed. I need to cover some of that today. Uh, For instance, and again, this is just one of many uh, examples I could give, but uh, the Walking Dead series has been going strong for, and that's a zombie show. You know, it's about dead people, zombies, you know. And it's been running for 12 years. And the amazing thing is from 18 to 49-year-olds, it was the most popular uh, show in the history of TV. Uh, More people watched it than any other broadcast in the history of television. And so 12 seasons, and I think it ended last year, I think. But I found out that they have seven sequels coming out uh, this year and next year. So The Walking Dead, here's a couple titles, Tales from the Walking Dead, Fear of the Walking Dead, The Walking Dead, Dead City. I mean, it goes on. Uh, But the word dead is in every title. So it should give you a clue, right? How many have recognized the number of horror movies increasing, especially Halloween? I mean, online, it's these horrible advertisements of these horrible movies. Uh, Horror movies are increasing. For an example, in the year 2000, 200 horror movies were filmed. But in 2016, 1,000 were filmed. And so we see a great increase of people having interest in demonic horror movies. A uh, book coming out called The Rise of Devil Worship in the United States by a gentleman, Billy Crone, did a study and found out that 66% of church attenders do not believe there is a real Satan or real demons. That's incredible, church people. A new Pew, a Pew Research study says that witches in the United States now outnumber the Presbyterian membership role. Can't make this up. This is happening. Social media is leading the way, infiltrating into our homes, our society, and into our families' lives with all kinds of perverse things that Satan wants you to feed on. I found out recently a new study that 50% of elementary students carry smartphones. Friend, if you're a parent, please understand that an elementary student does not need a smartphone. They do not need access to the perverse internet, especially at that age. Now, another thing is happening. Pornography is huge, and of course, 
The internet makes that available anywhere and everywhere. The top porn site, I won't name its name, but the top porn site has more daily visitors than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Friend, a society, a family, a culture cannot survive feeding on this trash. And we need to understand that, that this is a plot against families, against everything righteous that there is. So I need to talk about that today. Genesis chapter 3, let's turn there. This is back in the beginning. We talked about this chapter when we did our series on occupation. But I want to point just a couple things out here. Uh, Verse number 1. Now the servant was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say in that series, I made a point to make sure you understood, that is the defining mark. That is the question. That is his only attack. That's the only access he has to your life. If you can't answer that question, you're open for deception. Please write that down somewhere, friend. That is life and death. You need to know what the Bible says and who you are in Christ legally. The woman said to the servant, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. The enemy says, you'll not die. She just said it. She said, God said. (laughs) Let's get this. God said we would die. But the serpent says, that's not true. Oh, really? (laughs) You follow me? Oh, really? But she said, God said. Okay. When the woman saw the fruit was good for food. Really? Really? If you eat it, you'll die. It's good for food, right? Talk about deception. And pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. She already had all the wisdom that existed. She walks with God. He is is wisdom. He is all wisdom. She has wisdom. What what is it, okay, that this, this creature, Satan, could say to her? So here's the question. Here's the here's the big question. Why were you there, Eve, talking to the serpent? Why were you, and this is the title of today's message, why were you there considering input from him? When you already have truth, why would you be there talking to the serpent? Oh, well, you know, I'm strong enough. I'm curious. I want to have a conversation No, you're opening yourselves up for seduction and deception. Here's the truth, Eve. Let me tell you the truth. You see, before you ever walked up that tree, you were already in deception. You see, the action, you thought the action, I won't eat of it, was what would be the defining line. But see, the problem was the desire to go to the tree was the defining line, not the action of eating from the tree. See, you already set yourself in motion, Eve, Why were you there to begin with except your heart had already been deceived? Let me give you a hint. Let me paraphrase. Stay away from that tree. If it's going to kill you, stay away from it. But you chose to go towards it. You were already deceived before you got there. I have a friend who's lost a lot of weight. But I tell you the truth. Every time I see him, or most every time, that's an exaggeration, but a lot of times I see him, uh, he wants to hand, and he gave me this, he, he handed me three of these one day, three different kinds. Yes, I did eat half of it, but <laughs> I've had it for over a year, so that's pretty good. But nevertheless, he always is handing sugar out, always, always, always. And he's lost like 50, 60 pounds. He's always handing sugar, you know, things, sweet things out to people. And I think, keep thinking, why is he doing that? I mean, obviously, he's trying to get away from sugar. He's lost this weight. He understands that eating sugar is a hindrance to losing weight, but he's handing sugar out to everyone he comes across. You know why? He still loves sugar. And so if he can touch it, If he can buy it, it's going to help satisfy. He loves sugar. Now, he can play that game for a while, but one day, are you following me? Don't go near it. If it'll kill you, don't go near it. Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 6. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, saw among the simple, a noticed 
there a young man, a youth who lacked judgment. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night was setting in. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. With persuasive words, verse 21, she led him astray and she seduced him with her smooth talk. Let me ask you, do you think his intent going down that road was to meet this prostitute and, you know, violate himself? Do you think that was his intent? I don't think so. I think he was, she had to persuade him. The Bible says with persuasive talk, she persuaded him and she seduced him. I don't think he was going down that road. He was playing a game with his mind. I'll just go down and take a look. I'll go down where she lives, but I won't go into the house. And this is how it works. This is how it works. One Bible says, uh, one version says, with her persuasions, she caused him to yield. What are you doing talking to her? Why are you even allowing her to have the opportunity to persuade you? Set your place to be seduced. It says, with flattering lips, she seduced him. I always say, if people flatter you all the time, there's something wrong. They must be after something. That's just what I've learned over the years. His desire to take a look cost cost him his life. The Bible says this. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death or hell. Wow. If you knew it was that serious, why would you go down the street to begin with? You see, his heart was already deceived when he set down that path. Oh, I won't do it, Pastor. I won't do it. I'm just I'm just looking. Oh, you're a fool. That's how it works. James chapter 1, 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Now this scripture is a powerful illustration that you need to understand. First off, desire drags you places. Let's understand that. This verse talks of evil desire dragging you and enticing you. Enticing you to what? To formulate a plan. It says, and enticed, and after desire has conceived, conceived what? A plan. It gives birth to action or sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings death. Desire drags you. Now, what about good desire? What about having a great desire? Would that drag you? Yes. That's how you're made. Desire drags you. In fact, there's a famous book by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich. All he did was say, write on a piece of paper your goals, your dreams, and three times a day you reflect and rehearse those things, keeping before you your dream, your desire. Think and grow rich, simply you will develop a plan to accomplish that if you keep that in front of you. The enemy knows that. He sets before you enticing things that are not good for you, and you meditate, you pick up that desire, and it'll drag you. I can't tell you how many people Drenda and I have had to minister to who find themselves in places they never, ever, ever thought they'd see themselves in bondage, in trouble, in habits, and things they need to be set free from. They may have come from, a, a, say, an alcoholic family, and they vowed, I will never be an alcoholic, and now they're an alcoholic. They've, I vowed, I'll never do that, and now they're bound in that. What, what happened? You've got to trace it back. You're going to find back here was an enticement. Back here was it's okay. I'm not going to do that. But you picked up the thought. You picked up the picture. You picked up the, the direction. And you thought you'd play with it. Friend, you can't do that. It's going to drag you to fulfillment. 
I can always stop. It won't matter. Mm -mm. I remember I was uh, ministering somewhere with a, another pastor years ago. This is a long time ago. And not to make it, ex I mean, just, I don't want to belittle him, but he was, he was obese. But he said this. I don't know what the conversation, but he said this. He said, well, I should lose weight, but I'm not really that fat. Now, I thought to myself when he said that, I thought to myself, really? That's the first thing I think about when I see you. I mean, he's 100 pounds overweight. And I thought I could say the truth. No, you're obese. Well, that'd be rude. It could save his life. See, the lie he believed about that issue held him captive. Well, it's no big deal. I'm not that, you know, whatever. You know, it's truth is what sets us free. But I remember that day. I thought, really? That's what you think? Of you? That's how you think? Well, how do you think, friend? What are you putting up with that you have allowed to take over your life or allowed to dictate your life or allowed to motivate your life in a direction maybe you don't want to go? That was a lie. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith, meaning the faith means you're con convinced of what God says, and follow deceiving spirits, lying spirits, and things, lies, taught by, the, by demons. Such teaching comes through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Everyone born has a conscience. God has put in every human being, those that know him and don't know him, a conscience, an umpire that says, uh-uh, don't do that. Oh, no, don't do that. God has put it in every single person. And if you say no to the conscience long enough, that voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter. You know, when you sear your flesh, you lose feeling. You don't want to keep going where you lose feeling. You don't want to go someplace you can't hear your conscience. But as you keep saying no and keep ignoring that and ignoring that, you're going to find your place someplace you never thought you wanted to be. That's for sure. God helps us. Thank God for a conscience. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come, they may have life and have it more abundantly. How does a thief operate undercover in darkness when you're not looking? He wants to steal. Satan wants to steal what? What does he want to steal from you? Your stuff? Your health? Oh, no, no, no. No, that's not what he's after. He's after something bigger than that. He's after what did God say? He's after what does the word of God say? Because if he can steal the word of God out of your life, he has your stuff. He already has your health. He already has your life. Satan wants to make killing, destruction, and stealing your entertainment. Think of what is on TV. Think of the movies. Think of everything going on. Can you think of a normal family anywhere in movies and TV? Hard to find. Can you think where celebration of good things happen? Why is every story about something negative happening, some murder happening, some issue happening? Where are the stories of life? Where are the stories of God's healing? Where are the stories of God's goodness? They're not there, friend. The enemy has set a trap for you as you meditate on these things. What's happening is you're being desensitized, calling things that should not as normal, and then opening yourself up to demonic attack and bondage in your life. Jesus said, understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Everyone say, keep watch. Keep watch. Keep watch. Protect your house. Protect your heart. Protect your family. Protect your kids. Well, Pastor Gary, what's, what's the answer? What, what is my answer? How do, how do I handle this? Hebrews chapter 3 gives us insight. Let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 3. 
The issue is what? The desire. If desire is going to drag me somewhere, the issue is desire. So how do I change my desire? How can I get free? We're going to talk about that. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Simple. Why does it say today if you hear his voice? And it says if you hear, because you can get to a place you can't hear his voice. That's why. If you can hear today, this is the crazy thing about people. Okay, I know what I'm going to do is wrong, and I can repent tomorrow. Friend, you were already deceived before you start. If you cannot turn away from that thing in front of you right now with your fully conscious of what it is, and think you're going to repent tomorrow when you choose to do it today, tomorrow it will be harder to say no. The next day it will be harder to say no. See, you don't understand how this thing works. That is a lie. And that's why it says, today if you hear his voice, you need to understand this works. He says, if you hear his voice like, uh, and you don't harden your heart, when you keep rejecting and saying no, your heart's being hardened. It's being hardened. And he says that you did in the rebellion. Of course, this is talking about Israel in the wilderness there. Verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What is the deception of sin? It doesn't hurt you. That's what it is. The lie about sin or rebelling against what God says is right is that it's not going to hurt me. I'm in charge. I can stop. It's not going to hurt me. It's, not, it's, it's, you know, it's no big deal. Friend, that is the deception of sin. It's the deceitfulness of sin. That's why it says right after that, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Even in chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews says it one more time. Today, if you hear his voice, verse number 7, do not harden your hearts three times. I think he's trying to get a message across. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. It's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's an umpire you desperately need to keep you out of trouble. It's going to divide between the soul realm, your emotions, which get caught up in all kind of things, and the spirit. It's going to help you judge between marrow and uh, the joint and marrow. They're both bone, but they have different function. So it's going to help you discern between function. Men don't marry men. That function's not right. It's right there in the Word. You follow him. It's going to keep you free. It goes on and says it's going to judge the attitudes and the thoughts that you have. Before things ever get started, before you ever pick it up, he's going to judge that thought as not righteous, and you can cast down that imagination. But you have to know what did God say. Jesus in the wilderness, as he was tempted, said, it is written. If you can't say it is written, you go, oh, really? Like Eve, oh, really? God's holding out on me? Wow, you're smarter than God? Wow, cool. See, you have no defense. You have to know what God says. In this hour, it's life and death. It's always been life and death, but it happens faster now. Everything's sped up. So much trash hitting you right and left. I say, Pastor, how do I handle this then? Okay, how do I get free? How do I discern desire? How do I get rid of the desire? I don't want to do that. I, don't, I have this compulsion. I mean, how do I get free of that? I'm glad you asked. 1 John 1, 9, you better know this scripture. It's life and death for you. You better know it. If we confess, that's the first step. A lot of people don't confess. But when they hear truth, it will illuminate their need to confess. So thank God for that. Okay, if you confess your sin. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from unrighteousness. So he is our high priest of this new covenant. 
The Bible says if we have sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. Notice it does not say ask for forgiveness. So you, 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 you blow it. You do something. You know, you know it's wrong and you blow it. it do not, if you're a believer, you don't, don't ask for forgiveness. It doesn't say that. Forgiveness is a law of the kingdom. It's already in place. What it says is when you confess your sin, you're acknowledging the law. And it says that Jesus, your high priest, is your advocate, is going to what? Be faithful with what? Faithful to do what? And just. What's just means it means administration of law. He has no choice. It is not God choosing to, God already chose to forgive you before you were born. This is a finished work. It is a legal document in heaven. It's done. You're simply taking advantage of it. You're simply confessing, laying claim to that law. Your attorney, if you will, your high priest, is now your advocate with the Father, presenting him with the legal document, essentially, of what he provided for of your cleansing and your forgiveness. Is that making sense? So you receive it by faith. By faith, I'm forgiven. I don't beg for forgiveness. I don't, you know, when you make a mistake, you feel horrible and condemned. Understand God never condemns, he convicts. That condemnation does not come from God. You confess that sin, believe what God says. Jesus is faithful to forgive you of that sin because that's the law. If you confess it. But here's the part you really have to grab hold of. And he will cleanse us or purify us from unrighteousness. Now, by faith, this is the part you really have to grab hold of because this is the cleansing of the compulsion, the guilt, the, 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 the bondage. You're going to believe God to cleanse you. Forgiveness, yes. But it needs to go past that and to cleanse you of that compulsion. Let me say it this way, of that desire. You know, it's interesting in our culture, I don't drink alcohol. Never had an interest in it. I was there and my grandfather died of alcoholism. My dad, the day he died, held a bottle up and said, this is what killed him. It had a great impact on my life. But, you know, I've tasted it. It's horrible stuff. I can't, I really have a hard time believing how people can, I don't understand the lure. I can't, I can't figure it out. I think Coke tastes better. But anyway. I mean, I don't, you know, I walk into a store which has rows and rows of alcohol, all kinds, and quiet, total peace. There's no noise. There's no voice. Nothing. Doesn't move me. No voice, no temptation, no compulsion, nothing. I'm, I'm free. You understand what I'm saying? It's like walking down the street, nothing, zero. Now, if I get close to a a Jolly Pirate donut shop, (laughs) that'll speak to me. (laughs) There's long johns with the vanilla cream and the chocolate icing, just hot off the grill, you're hot off the... (laughs) Now, you know, really no difference. It talks to me. I'm sure people here could care less about donuts. But God will remove that compulsion. And you'll get stronger, and maybe you can have a donut once in a while. But if you have to have 10 of them, you're in idolatry. And you're in bondage. And you need to have self-control. The Bible says fruit of the Spirit is self-control. God will help you because I want to be free. I don't want voices yakking at me and talking to me. You want another donut? Think about the donut. Think about the, oh, I know it's almost lunchtime, but you know what I'm saying. (laughs) It talks to you. You know, that's not freedom. Freedom is peace. I'm free. I'm not tempted. I'm not, this thing's not yakking at me, right? Compulsion. So when it says he cleanses you of unrighteousness, he's going to cleanse you of that compulsion, that desire. So let's say you go out, you mess up, 
And so you go through John, 1 John, John 1, 9. And you confess that by faith, even though you feel horrible, you feel guilty, you pay no attention to your emotions because this is a legal issue. You don't have to feel like you own your car. You have the title. Right? Someone tries to take it. You don't have to judge your emotions. You pull the title out and say, it's my car. Okay. This is a legal issue. So let's say you do that by faith, and in 10 minutes you go out and do the same thing again. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to do the same thing. You say, well, Pastor, I just did that. I just did it again. I said, listen, stop that. You have to stand on the word of God because you can't deliver yourself. You would have already done that if you could have. You can't get free yourself. You're trapped, but God will deliver you, and you have the word of God, the living and active word of God, and if you will do what the Bible says, you will walk out of that thing. So maybe the first day you have to do it 25 times. You mean 25? Yeah, every time you take a bite of that donut and you set it down and you keep looking at it, the first off, get, get it out of sight. Cleanse your house. Get stuff away from you so you can walk free. But let's say that you do fall into that trap again 25 times. Well, maybe the next day it'd be 10 times. And the next day it'd be five times. See, if you will stay on the word of God and you, by faith, your, your emotions will go nuts. Forget your emotions. This is a legal issue. That is one of the biggest things you've got to learn. It has no bearing on your emotions at all. It's a legal issue. You can say it in tears. You can say it however. You can say, this is my, my legal right. I confess by the word of God I am free from that compulsion. That desire does not move me. I am not led by that desire. It has no control over me. In the name of Jesus, I am free of that thing. And you believe it, you say it. And you go out and do it again, you say it all over again. Say it all over again. This is how you get free of habits, how you change your life. That's how it works. You need to be free. The enemy will set things in front of you, but you don't have to go down the street where she lives. You don't have to go into the Jolly Pirate Donut Shop where you have the smells and the pictures and other people eating the donuts. You know and you should know there are certain places that you really don't need to be. The Holy Spirit will help you. But I tell you what, freedom is better than bondage any day. Being happy and not depressed is better any day. Being full of the joy of the Lord is better any day. And God wants you free. He wants you able to hear his voice, be led in life by his voice. So you have to learn to submit to God. Trust him. He wants to help you. Be free. He's got a greater life than that donut, trust me. Let me say it again. There's a greater future for you than that donut. time we have here. You know, I come from a pizza family. Grew up doing pizzas. Uh, even though I'm not my ideal weight right now, you can imagine growing up in the pizza shop as a young man. That was, op we were open to one o'clock in the morning and then we go to White Castle. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, in New Albany, when I grew up, we were the only place open to one o'clock. And, uh, after that, we go eat White Castles. <laughs> and so you can imagine, I was 50 or 60 pounds overweight by the time I was 19. And then God called me to preach. And he told me to go to Oral Roberts University. And, of course, besides the great issues I had of not qualifying for their level of excellence with my 1.9 average in high school... They made an exception for me because I had just been born again, and they said, okay, you, I see the change in your life. We want you to come on and, 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 you know, come on to school. And I got a letter of acceptance, and the letter of acceptance said, you are been approved to come to Oral Roberts University, but on the first day of campus, you will be weighed. We noticed you're quite a bit overweight, and if you don't know, Oral Roberts has a very high standard of physical exercise and physical health. 
and you must, learn, must lose 25 pounds before you get here. And before you go to the admissions office, you will go directly to the aerobic center and you'll be weighed to see if you qualify to come to school here. Oh, pastor, that's offensive. How can they do that? That's, they can't do that. That's what they say today. That's what people say today. They have lawsuits all over the place today doing that, right? They don't do it anymore. Best thing that ever happened in my life. I went out and bought a pair of red ball jet shoes. And remember those? The, like tennis shoes? How many know you don't jog in those? I tried to. I got shin splints and all that. But I did. I, I got to the first day of school, and I was two pounds under. I weighed 209 pounds when I got there. I remember that. Day of celebration. But they required physical exercise every single week. You had to fill out a chart of what exercise you did, how many minutes you did it, and you had to do so much exercise every single week to even pass the school or graduate from there. So I started running and got up to running 10 miles a day, 5 miles a day. I'm telling you the truth. It, was, it felt like being born again. It was so awesome to be in shape and to be able to run and not have all that 60 pounds of pizza on me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was amazing. And then I rode bike. I mean, I just love, I mean, I'm telling you, it was so totally different. Way to, it was just amazing. So when God gives us his truth, it's for your freedom. Yes. And I'm telling you, freedom is so much better than pizza <laughs> or donuts or whatever it is, alcohol, whatever it is. I'm telling you, freedom. Jesus will set you free. He'll set you free. I'm telling you, he'll set you free. I know the enemy's lied to you all these years and said, you can never, you'll never do that. You'll never do that. You'll never do that. You can't do that. You can't. That's a lie. You can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. Your life can change. But let me ask you, what are you putting up with? Why are you putting up with it? Why are you putting up with it? Don't go down that road. Make a decision for freedom. Let's stand to our feet. God has a plan for your life, and it's a good one. The enemy wants to snare you and trap you in places you never thought you'd be. It's getting, it's getting dark out there. I mean, darker. It's always been dark, but it's getting really dark. You've got to make right decisions. It's like setting your supper table. What am I going to eat, broccoli or donuts? I mean, what am I going to watch? What am I going to feed my kids? What am I going to put in front of our eyes? What is our family going to feed on? What, 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 are, we, what are we putting in our brains, right? What are we putting in our spirits? Well, no wonder we're sick. No wonder we're not happy. No wonder we're depressed. No wonder we're discouraged. No wonder we're broke. That's right, friend. It's just how it is. You know, my friend, my, I wanted to tell him, you could lose 100 pounds. But that was his new normal. We all battle with, you know, we understand that the food, you know, we understand everyone, it's easy to gain weight in our culture. But when I had that wake-up call, you have to choose. Pizza or where I've called you to go. Are you going to change? I said yes. And it wasn't easy losing that weight. I had to be disciplined. I had to walk it out, run it out. I had to do it. And you can ask my kids, I mean, for my entire life, since that experience, I've always exercised. My dad never once did I ever see him exercise. <laughs> so I had no history of exercise. <clears throat> but I am thankful to this day that Oral Roberts had that set that way. He taught we are a whole, a whole being, body soul and spirit, or spirit, soul, and body. You know, we're, you know, if your body's sick, you're sick. If your spirit's sick, you're sick. If your soul's sick, you know. He knew that we needed, needed to have all of it right. 
And I, I thank God for that, what he did. God wants it right for you too. So we have to start with the most important, our spirit. Our spirit gives us the strength to walk out over our emotions and over our flesh. We are designed to live by our spirit. So I want you to bow your heads with me. You know, the Bible says it's very simple. Whoever calls on the name of Jesus has the legal right to become part of the family of God and a member of God's household and a citizen of God's kingdom. Citizens have legal rights. We just talked about one today. 1 John 1, 9. And so if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to know God like you're talking. I need help. I need to know the good life, the free life. I need God's help with that. Yes, you do. But you can start right now today by saying yes. We're all going to pray out loud together here over at Powell Online Campus. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to ask you to come forward because th this is between you and God. But I do ask people to raise their hand. Why? Because I want you to mark the spot. Because Monday's coming. Temptation's coming. Problems are coming. And I want you to remember the day you said yes. Now, wait a minute. I said yes. I'm not alone. God's with me. He's promised never to leave me or forsake me. I can pray. The Holy Spirit is my counselor. He will help me with decisions. I don't have to be afraid. So I have you raise your hand. Mark the spot. So we're all going to pray out loud. If you're here today over at Powell Online, you would say, Pastor, I need God like that. I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to call on the name of Jesus on this Sunday morning? If so, I want you to raise your hand right now. In the auditorium, just raise your hand up. Say, really stick it up high, you know, really high. Thank you. I see hands up. I see hands up, hands up. Stick them up high. God is good. No need to run from him. He's good. He believes in you. He wants you to win. Over at Powell, hands up. Online, hands up. Mark the spot. And let's all pray together right now and say these words. Say, Father... You said in your Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus, that you'll receive me. You make me brand new on the inside. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to live life the kingdom way, your way, the free way. I need that. So today I say yes. Let my name be recorded in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus. From this day forward, I declare you as my Lord and Savior. I receive your goodness. Amen. Amen. Give yourself a hand. You can have a seat. Pastor Drin is joining us. We're going to receive our Sunday morning offering right now. You can give uh, with an envelope. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. You'll give those to the ushers on the way out. Or you can give online. You'll see there online how to give uh, by that online. But understand this. You've got to win the money thing. You can win the money thing. Okay? Again, it's easy to have your normal become normal. But why don't you change that with a different picture? What does God say about your finances? What can he do with your finances? How can he help you with your finances? Instead of just saying, this is where I'm at, this is my limitations... This is where I come from. I have no ability. I have no whatever it is. That's not true. The Bible says when you are born again, all things become new. The old's passed away, which means you have a tremendously changed potential because you and God can now do amazing things. Drend and I, as you know, nine years severely in debt, panic attacks, antidepressants. God gave us a dream to start a business which is still functioning 40 years later, still producing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I'm not that good. I, trust me, if I would have figured it out in those nine years, I would have. Friend, I don't care where you come from. One idea from God, one direction, one change, one little tweaking, change your life forever in the financial area. So we're going to give today. We're going to worship God with our giving. So I'd ask you to stand with me right now. Why don't you lay your hand on that gift? Now, this is an act of faith, just like we've been talking about. It has no bearing on your feelings, has no bearing on what your circumstances say. It's all based on what does God say. 
Take your eyes off your bill drawer. Take your eyes off the anxious thoughts you might have about your money. And you're going to set your thoughts on what does God say because you're going to say the same thing every day after this. You're going to say, you're going to say this. This is, your, this is you now. This is your legal right. This is who you are now in Christ. So when the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God gives seed to the sower and bread for eating. Notice he gives both. He gives the seed that you give and he gives the bread or everything you need to run your household abundantly. And he increases your seed, increases your influence financially. And the Bible goes on and says in that chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians that he will make, you, I'm, not, I'm quoting right now, he will make you rich in all things in every way at all times so that on every occasion you have all that you have need of and then you can be generous on every occasion that's what the Bible that's that's who you are you say I sure don't that's how that this is who you are See, you're not trying to prosper God has already declared you prosperous what you need to do is to hear how to do that the Holy Spirit but that's who you are you're not trying to prosper You've been declared by God himself as prosperous. So we're going to agree over his word. It's his word. And when it becomes your word, it'll change your life. Okay? All right. Let's lay your hands on that and say this with me. Say, Father. Father. It's your word. It's your word. Your truth. Your truth. It's now my truth. It's now my it's truth. It's who I am. It's who I am. Right now. Right now. All my needs are met. All my needs are I met. I have an abundance. I have abundance. I live out of debt. I live out of debt. Financially free. Financially free. I carry out my assignment with I full provision. I carry out my assignment with full provision. I'm generous on every occasion. I'm generous on every occasion. I thank you for that. I thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So good. Then what you do is you pray in the Spirit. Now, you received it by faith. You pray in the Spirit to get the plan to carry it out. He'll lead and direct your steps. That's right. you with me? Yes. That's how you handle that. Yes. But this is your truth. This is your confession. Then you pray and let God show you, okay, here, 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 and, change, and he'll show you how to do it. All right. Go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. That word will save our lives. Amen? Amen. So good because sin is actually the enemy's distraction from your destiny. Mm, yes. See, he wants to get you off, pull you off, whether it, whatever it is, you know. And don't be offended. We got to make sure the world, the culture has taught us to be offended yeah. so that we can't be free. And so now they've done is they've twisted all the words and minimized any sin to be all acceptable when it's going to cause death, hurt, destruction in people's lives. Uh, At the first responders, I was uh, walking around visiting with people and saw the sweetest little baby. And I went over to this little baby and just touched him, and he just smiled at me. This little baby was born addicted to drugs. Somebody in our church is raising this little baby and helping him to try to meet the marks. He's way underweight and all these things. When you see what sin does to people, we cannot minimize it. We have to say we love the person, and God does not condemn you. Jesus came to invite you into his kingdom and to help you get free, to not bring condemnation, but right. to help you into freedom. And so, but we have to call sin, sin, because it's poison. It's right. poison. And it was that sin that the enemy minimized her going to that tree and eating of it that caused the destruction of all Uh, people that would be born after that. And so you just see this little baby. And thank God for people that are bringing truth and righteousness, amen, and justice. We have to have those things because people's lives get damaged and destroyed when truth isn't told. So you know why the enemy wants to mask it and sugarcoat it and and say it's not wrong and and these, you know, love is love and everybody can do what they want to do and all that, you know. The enemy's setting traps and snares like we've never seen. And people, we've got to be wise to the enemy's schemes. Amen. And we cannot insult grace. The Bible tells us don't insult grace, the spirit of grace, by calling something that's sin, not sin, and by continuing in it and saying, well, if God loves me, he'll accept what I do. No, if you love God, you'll accept what he says. Amen. You'll say what he says. You'll believe what he says. And with that now, there's not condemnation. Reject that. 
Today you might be hearing the message, go, oh, I'm condemned now, Pastor Gary talked about this or that. No, you're not condemned. You're free from those things and you can walk out of them. So don't be condemned. You hold your head up high. You know, right. can you tell we're both on a low carb diet? <laughs> He's preaching donuts. Anyway, we all struggle in things, but the Word of God is our freedom. And unless we're willing to call sin, sin, and the truth, truth, we can't be free, yeah. man. So let's call it what it is. Uh, God is faithful. He's good. You know, I want to encourage you, moms and dads, in this hour, especially mm. in this t- time, especially spend time outdoors and not in stores. Amen. Stay out of those places. They want to shove all of that and indoctrinate your kids. Let their paycheck be, you know, let them, let their finances go down if they're trying to hurt and destroy your family, right? One of the things we did with our kids, we took them outdoors. We played games with them. We hiked with them. We swam with them. We went out and saw the national parks. Just keep your kids out of the stores and please don't drop them there and let them indoctrinate them for the full day while you're going out doing what you want to do. No, families got to, parents got to guard your kids. You got to guard your kids. If you want to go there and witness to people, but don't put your kids, your godly seed, what they see is what they're going to emulate. It teaches them. So make sure you're wise, protect their hearts, but more importantly, spend time with them and they'll look to you instead of the world system. You know, same thing with the television and the ads and all that. Those are all messages. And I'm telling you, they are jamming them. That is a propaganda technique, by the way. If you jam something through all frequencies as hard and fast as you can, eventually people just get bombarded so much that they give into it. Do not let that happen to your kids. I think I'll make a hashtag Spend time in, in, spend time outdoors, not in stores. Okay. Yeah. You, <laughs> it's my way of saying boycott. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, especially speaking, in June. Yes. Well, there you go. Oh, it's not, but you're speaking specifically <laughs> with the prime. Amen. 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 It's ridiculous. A whole month, and they've already started it. They've already, you know jump started. Just say no. Let it show up at their balance sheet and they'll change maybe their idea about it. So anyway, we want to pray over you and believe with you today. Before we do though, I want to say Flashpoint is coming. Uh, The Truth and Freedom Tour, yay, June 8th and 9th. And I just want to let you know also that with the uh, Flashpoint uh, Freedom Tour, we're going to have a tent for 2,500 people out here. The main event in the tent. And Mike Lindell is going to be here. Kenneth Copeland is going to be here. George Pearsons is going to be here. Uh, There's some others that are going to be. Hank Kuneman, Lance Wallnow. We've got such an incredible uh, whole slate of folks. And there's another name that I can't say yet that may be here. So anyway, We need you to register if you have not. We are almost at capacity, and it's going to be an amazing. I believe this is going to shake a revival in Ohio. I believe we are going to see the kingdom come, the will of God be done. And so I want you to be in prayer about it. Get registered. Don't get mad at us if you didn't register, okay? You have to register, right. even though it's Share the church, word. Share the register. word, too. I'm believing that this is it's really... Free. It's yes, free. it's free. We're going ra- to We're going to shock... Uh, we're going to shock the world, amen? <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I think it's no coincidence it's June 8th and 9th. And so plan to be here, serve here, pray over this event. We have parking set up in different places around the area. Could you, I ask you to be ladies and gentlemen and serve our guests, amen? I believe God's going to bring people into this church that have been looking for a church that teaches God's word, the truth, and the kingdom. And so we want to invite people to come and see a revival and a revolution in our nation, amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you. Yes, go ahead. 
thank you for your people, Lord. Thank you that they are called by your name. And God, you've called us out of darkness and you give us the strength, the grace to walk out our freedom. There is no condemnation, but there's freedom and victory in you, God. So we submit ourselves to you. We resist the enemy. He has to flee. Thank you. These people walk in victory. They walk in truth. They walk in righteousness. They are a light in a dark world, God. Sickness and disease has no place in their body. We command healing to their body, to the body of Christ. By his stripes you were healed, therefore you are healed. And we stand on that word and we see it manifest. Father, we thank you that provision is theirs. They walk in freedom, freedom from debt, freedom from financial oppression, freedom from fear, and freedom from condemnation. And they are lights and soldiers of light in a dark world. In Jesus' name, you go forth and you conquer kingdoms and take territory. Amen. 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 See you next time. God bless you. Give me that candy bar. <laughs>